Abend zur Veranstaltung Unerhört afghanische Frauen und ihre Kämpfe. Insbesondere möchte ich am Vorabend des Internationalen Frauentags die Frauen sehr herzlich hier begrüßen. Und natürlich unsere Gäste Osala Nemat und Sana Safi. Danke, dass Sie nach Wien gekommen sind. Als Moderator fungiert heute mein Kollege Ali Ahmad, der später unsere beiden Referentinnen ausführlich vorstellen wird. Ali Ahmad hat mit mir die Veranstaltung heute konzipiert. Er ist Arzt und Forscher. Er hat einen Masterabschluss in Friedens- und Konfliktforschung. Und er arbeitet zu Diaspora, Migrationsforschung, Sicherheits- und Arbeitsbeziehungen in Afghanistan, gewaltfreie Strategien, die Außenpolitik Afghanistans und so weiter und so fort. Seine letzte Studie, die er veröffentlicht hat bei uns im VEDC, heißt Refugees Return to Poverty, Unemployment and Despair, Afghans Labor Market and the Status of Women. Ali, vielen Dank, dass du die Moderation heute übernommen hast. Willkommen, Ali. Ich möchte mich an dieser Stelle auch bei der österreichischen Entwicklungszusammenarbeit bedanken, der Austrian Development Agency, die die Veranstaltung heute finanziert und möglich macht bei der Diplomatischen Akademie, dass wir wieder hier sein können und für die gute Zusammenarbeit. Aber mein besonderer Dank gilt vor allen Dingen den afghanischen Vereinen, Akis, Katib, Neuer Staat, den Afghan Wulas, dem Verein der afghanischen Studierenden Igasus, dem Interkulturellen Entwicklungszentrum sowie dem Aktiv- und Passant-Verein, die uns bei der Bewerbung der Veranstaltung unterstützt haben. Aber mein Dank gilt vor allen Dingen den Engagement dieser Vereine, das ist sehr wichtig, sehr nötig. Wir versuchen das so weit als möglich als Wiener Institut für internationalen Dialog und Zusammenarbeit auch zu unterstützen. Ich denke, das war nicht nur wichtig beim Ankommen der vielen, vielen Flüchtlinge aus Afghanistan, sondern ist jetzt genauso wichtig, wenn es um Fragen der sozialen, politischen und kulturellen Integration in Österreich geht. Herzlichen Dank. Den Vereinen und einen Applaus den Vereinen. In diesem Sinne möchte ich Sie auch ähm, darauf hinweisen, dass wir morgen eine Kooperationsveranstaltung mit dem Verein Akis machen werden. Äh, die Veranstaltung findet auf Dari statt, also für diejenigen von Ihnen, die Dari-sprachig sind. Draußen am Infotisch gibt es äh, Informationen, was wir dort machen. Der Titel der Veranstaltung heißt Der Kampf um die Stärkung der afghanischen Frauen. Da wird es also noch ein etwas interneres Gespräch von afghanischen Frauen in Österreich, aber auch mit unseren Gästen geben. Unsere Gäste können uns sehr aktuell über die Situation, über die Bedingungen in Afghanistan berichten. Und natürlich am Vorabend des Frauentags interessieren uns auch die Kämpfe und vor allem die Kämpfe der afghanischen Frauen um Gleichberechtigung und Selbstbestimmung in einem Land, das durch Gewalt und sehr oft männliche Gewalt durch Krieg, internationale Interventionen besonders geprägt ist. Afghanistan ist einer der gefährlichsten Plätze für Frauen, das wissen Sie. In einer Studie ähm, der Thomson Reuters Foundation wurde Afghanistan als zweitgefährlichstes Land für Frauen weltweit eingestuft. Heute sind die Taliban wieder am Vormarsch. Sie kontrollieren teilweise oder ganz 55 Prozent des Landes. Das heißt nicht 55 Prozent der Einwohner und Einwohnerinnen, also die großen Städte sind schon unter der Kontrolle der Regierung, aber natürlich Teile der Provinzen sind teilweise oder ganz unter der Kontrolle der Taliban. Und die jüngsten Friedensverhandlungen, von denen Sie sicher schon gehört haben, zwischen den Taliban und der US-Delegation, geben jetzt natürlich einerseits Anlass zur Hoffnung, dass man vielleicht für dieses geschundene Land ein, einen Weg des Friedens finden kann. Und andererseits natürlich zu großer Sorge, darüber werden wir heute sicher reden, dass die fragilen Errungenschaften, die Frauen erkämpft haben nach 2001, den Freiraum genützt haben, die Möglichkeiten genützt haben, die sie haben, durch die internationale Intervention, dass die jetzt wieder gefährdet sind. Sie sitzen nicht am Tisch der Verhandlungen und auch die Regierung sitzt nicht am Tisch der Verhandlungen, was großen Anlass zur Sorge geben darf. 
Bevor ich jetzt an meinen Kollegen Ali Ahmad für die Podiumsdiskussion übergebe, noch ein paar organisatorische Anmerkungen von meiner Seite. Ich rede hier jetzt noch auf Deutsch. Das soll Ihnen auch einen Anreiz geben, später in der Diskussion, die wir machen, auch Fragen auf Deutsch zu stellen. Wir haben eine simultane Übersetzung. Der Vortrag selber und die Diskussion wird hauptsächlich oder wird ganz auf Englisch stattfinden. Insofern, wenn Sie, noch, wenn Sie die, sich noch keinen Kopfhörer gebraucht haben, aber eine Übersetzung brauchen, tun Sie das bitte. Der Kanal 2 ist für Deutsch und der Kanal 3 dann für Englisch. Am Ende der Veranstaltung bitte ich Sie dann, die Kopfhörer einfach am Stuhl liegen zu lassen. Wir sammeln die dann später ein. Im Anschluss haben wir dann auch eine Möglichkeit, noch ein bisschen informell zusammenzusitzen. Es wird einen kleinen Imbiss, einen kleinen Umtrunk draußen geben, wo wir noch gemeinsam ein bisschen reden können. Und last but not least, die finden auf unseren Sitzen Feedbackbögen, die ich Sie bitte am Ende der Veranstaltung auszufüllen, uns ein Feedback zu geben, damit wir auch beim nächsten Mal das hoffentlich noch besser machen. Aber auf jeden Fall würden wir uns auf Anregungen von Ihrer Seite freuen. So, jetzt bleibt mir nicht viel übrig, als uns allen einen interessanten Abend zu wünschen und nochmal einen schönen und herzlichen Frauentag. Nice introduction. Uh, thank you, the audience, for coming uh, in our today's event on Afghanistan, Afghan women, and the story of their struggle. Uh, uh, I'm very delighted to be moderating uh, this evening's uh, panel with our uh, distinguished guests, uh, Sana Safi and Dr. Ozila Nemat. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, it's a, a matter of pleasure for me personally because I, I, I follow their work uh, um, a lot uh, and with passion. Um, and I would like to uh, also thank the VIDC uh, for timely organizing uh, tonight's event. Uh, uh, basically, it's important because tomorrow is 8th of March, is International Women's Day. So happy International Women's Day uh, for our guests, for, for the audience, for us, for all of us. And uh, this is also important because, as Michael mentioned, um, uh, about the, uh, the brutal war uh, which has been going on in Afghanistan for, for, for 40 years, and particularly the last um, uh, 18 years that since the uh, U.S. military intervention in Afghanistan, and part of that intervention was, uh, was warranted, and, and besides that was to liberate Afghan, Afghan women. So nearly two decades after this, this military intervention and the support of the international community to, to, to help uh, Afghan women, uh, where are uh, Afghan women? And the U.S. government with the Taliban have been conducting a series of rounds of talks with the, with, with the Taliban in Doha, uh, basically behind, behind closed doors, where are women? Uh, what is the women's contribution in these peace talks and what is the women's situation in Afghanistan at the moment? Uh, these are the questions that uh, I, of course, I, I'm not in a position to answer, but our very esteemed panelists, Dr. Urzila Nehmat and Sana Safi, will touch uh, upon, upon that. But before that, I would like to briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, Dr. Urzila Nehmat, uh, she lives in Kabul and she's uh, an Afghan scholar and civil society activist. She, she was born, lived and worked in Afghanistan and for 14 years uh, she was a refugee in, in uh, Pakistan. Uh, she experienced different aspects of life uh, in varying environment during Afghanistan Taliban government. She put her, uh, herself many times directly at risk and launched underground literacy and health education programs for women and girls. Orzela Nemat holds a PhD in Development Studies from School of Oriental and African Studies, a Master's from University College London, and has been a Yale World Fellow Class of 2008. As an expert in political ethnography, her research interests include dev development and, and conflict, gender, governance, and borderland studies. Her PhD thesis in development studies focus on local governance relations that results from external interventions. Following to completion of her doctorate studies and two years of teaching at SOS UK, uh, Dr. Nehmat moved back to her home country, uh, serving briefly as the Afghan president's advisor on local governance and then leading Afghan think tank Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit. Uh, um, this is uh, a leading think tank in Afghanistan, 
Uh, as an Afghan scholar with over 16 years of experience in development, practice, activism, and women's rights, uh, Dr. Neymat brings an enriching experience into her new career path, leading Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit, one of the top research think tanks in Central Asia and Afghanistan. Dr. Neymat provides regular analysis through her writings, talks, media appearance, and scholarly work on conflict, development, gender, and the way local power relations affected by global interventions. Thank you very much for coming, Dr. Dr. Neymat. And on my right, Sana Safi. She is a senior presenter for the uh, uh, daily BBC News Pashtut uh, TV news program, BBC Narei Dawacht, BBC World Right Now. Nearly 1.5 million people connect with her on social media, that is Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I'm one of them, and I'm sure you have many uh, in, in, in the audience. Sana Safi joined BBC World Service, of which BBC News Pashtut is part. Uh, she uh, started as a field reporter in 2006 in the eastern Afghan city of Jalalabad. She then worked as a BBC Pashto radio and TV producer and, and presenter, based in London. As a presenter of BBC Pashto uh, TV news program, Sana Safi was the first broadcast journalist to interview Afghanistan's first lady, Rola Ghani, after her husband, Afshar Ghani, took office in 2014. In 2015, Safi was given rare access to some of Afghanistan's rising super rich class in Dubai as well as Kabul, reporting on the flow of capital between Kabul and the Gulf countries, corruption and investment opportunities for Afghanistan. She has been reporting on issues such as Afghan interpreters either being rejected or left behind by the British and American forces, female participation in Afghanistan security forces, maternal mortality, migration, and other social and political issues facing Afghanistan. Before joining uh, uh, BBC, Sana Safi worked as the only female journalist in Jalalabad state-run radio and television station. She also headed an educational institution in Jalalabad, uh, which is in eastern Afghanistan, the capital city of Nangarhar, which provided literacy and, and numeracy classes for women and children deprived of education and the Taliban regime. Thank you very much, Sana, for being with us tonight. So they have a wealth of, uh, world of, uh, wealth of um, experience uh, and have covered uh, different aspects of Afghan life and particularly women. I, I, I directly hand over the stage to Sana Safi to uh, inform us what, what you want to tell us. Um, exactly 40 years ago, just after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, my cousin got married to someone she loved and adored. Within three months of her marriage, her husband was killed by unknown people. And she never, she went back to her parents' home and she stayed with her brothers. And she never got remarried, she, she stayed with them to this day. Why with her brothers, you may ask? Well, given the context and the country in this situation, you need a male protector, not just to protect you, but to provide for you as well. Then, as you're all aware, the anti-Soviet war started. An estimated two million Afghans were killed. Between five to seven others, five to seven million others were forced to become refugees, not just in within Afghanistan internally, but outside of Afghanistan. Around three million of them were injured, and countless others disappeared. Speaking of disappearance, just um, a couple of years before the Soviet withdrawal of Afghanistan, the Soviet withdrawal of, um, from the country, my uncle left one day and he never returned. He was a fresh graduate. My grandmother died not knowing where our youngest child was. And then the Soviets left. Um, you probably are able to see the parallels. They left Afghanistan, the civil war started, and the country was turned upside down by people who were fighting the anti, who were involved in the anti-Soviet campaign. They turned on each other and turned Kabul and other cities into hell on earth. Out of the chaos, as you're all aware of, came the Taliban, a fundamentalist group 
who brought some sort of law and order to Afghanistan with, through their strict interpretation of Islam. They ruled with iron fist. I will never forget the day that they shut my school. I, I mean, it's a story. It's, it's tragedy after tragedy, but it's not unique. One day in the morning, sunny morning in, in Kandahar, um, I put on my black dress that my mother had made me with some lovely golden details, and I went to school. And the lady at the door said, well, there is no school. I said, why? She said, well, the Taliban just told us to close it. So I said, okay. So I went home, not knowing what it meant for me or anyone else. So when I went home, I told my mother, and I could see the, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so teary. I could see the look on her face because she knew what it meant. She knew it was bad. So she started searching for underground schools, like the one Ursula may have worked and founded one. After a couple of um, weeks, she finally found one. Um, a school that was secular. It was uh, founded by a husband and wife. They were teaching a secular curriculum to boys and girls. So we had a mixed school. Um, my classmates were boys who were equally deprived of education. And um, so I started attending that school. My mother would drop me and pick me up. Um, so no one could see us that we were going to school. Then after a couple of weeks at the new school, uh, the Taliban found out. They found out, raided the school, and imprisoned my teachers, both the husband and wife, um, with some alleged torture as well. They were imprisoned for 15 days. Um, upon their release, they packed their bags and left Afghanistan, they left Kandahar, closed the school. Then again, my mother was left wondering, what is she going to do with me? You know, I'm, I was going to grow up not being educated. So she started asking around. Um, she started people, she started asking people in the other neighborhood, friends, family, whether, she, whether they could recommend somebody trustworthy who was literate enough to teach me how to read and write. And she finally found one. Then I had a governess in the Western sense, not in the traditional Western sense, because it sounds that I was this privileged child who had a governess. It wasn't like that. It was out of necessity. So the lady that my mother found was able to teach me how to read and write, apart from uh, alongside uh, religious schooling as well, so the Quran and other books. Um, that she taught me. Then several years into the Taliban regime, um, a lady that I knew and became my best friend was forced to marry um, at, at a young age to someone equally young who was underage. She soon moved into, obviously after the marriage, you move into the family with your extended uh, in-laws she did that, and she soon found out that she wasn't welcomed. She was abused physically, emotionally, and um, alleged sexually as well, which is not uncommon. It happens. Within six months, she ran away. She went to her parents' home, and she told them that. Um, she, uh, she begged them, actually, to not let her go back to the in-laws um, family. The parents were liberal enough, educated enough, in some sense, it, it's, it's quite a contradiction, isn't it, you might ask. But they knew that the daughter couldn't continue to stay with the in-laws family because of the abuse. So they went the next day and asked for her divorce. It was the Taliban regime, obviously, the in-laws uh, realized that should this case go to an official Taliban court, they would be given harsh sentence or harsh treatment. 
they decided to settle out of court and um, give, grant her the divorce. So my friend uh, went back to her parents' house and um, she stayed with them, but she obviously became the laughing stock of the community because she was divorced at a young age. I mean, who or what young woman, good woman, will get divorced at such a young age, so something must have been wrong with her. That's what the community said about her. Then, obviously, 9-11 happened, and the international community, headed by the US, went to Afghanistan to topple the Taliban regime, and that's when Afghans decided, well, not decided, Afghans saw some hope. Um, they said that you know, there w it was a new era. Women started to integrate back into the public life. Kids could go to school. Girls started to enroll um, at schools, universities, workplaces, and other institutions. A few years into the international involvement, a few years ago, my cousin went out on a day out. He was on a day out with his friends. Again, a graduate, an engineer. He was shot dead by international forces. He had been mistaken for someone else. He was only a male member of the family. And then in January this year, it's not ending, <laughs> sorry, there was a car bomb attack in Kabul. And my sister lost her husband. Sorry, I thought I dealt with it. He was barely 25. The funny thing is, they were the nine. Well, they were the 9/11 generation, I would say, because they grew up with iPhones, not iPhones, but smartphones. They went to parks together. They started dating when they were in high school. When I say dating, Afghan style, it's usually you talk on the phone with somebody you love or you have you fancy. It's nothing more than that. It's just. You just talk on the phone and you cry, perhaps, because you, you, you just remember all the bad things that's happening. And it's usually an emotional relationship. There is nothing physical. The worst they probably do is a kiss here and there, but that's it. Or green tea, shnei chai, chai sabs in a park somewhere. That's it. But anyway, they decided to get married just before... Um, six months ago, just six months before he was brutally murdered. So they, they decided to get in together, so they, they were like, okay, we need to make it official. Um, so they got married and they moved in together. By now, some of you are tired, some of you are bored, some of you are saying, my God, this is a lot for one family. And some of you are asking, why the hell is she telling us this? What's that to do with us? If you're bored, I'm sorry, I know. It's cliche, Afghanistan, war, bad news. <laughs> if you're the group thinking this is a lot for one family, it's not one family, unfortunately. This is the story of the majority of Afghans. Next time you meet an Afghan, just ask them questions. Most of us, by the way, we wear a mask. We suppress all of this. I have been doing it, and it's only just that I'm talking about it. Most of us don't talk about it, but we have them. And if you're the group thinking why I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this because I want to give you a clear picture of the root cause of what's happening in Afghanistan, or the root cause of where Afghanistan is today and what the situation of its women is today. Also, so it allows you to, to see what needs to happen if Afghanistan and the situation of Afghan women is to change anytime soon. And to invite you to see the role you might be able to play in the future of um, Afghanistan. I know I'm taking longer than I should, and um, I'm sorry for that, but I will try and wrap up quickly. So the root cause of what Afghanistan is going through is obviously war. 
and war brings poverty, weakens law and order, breaks institutions, and forces people to do the unthinkable, just to survive. They're not monsters, they just want to survive. And you know that Afghanistan is low in human development. Some of the biggest problems that Afghan women themselves, um, according to a recent, the 2018 Asia Foundation survey of that Afghan people, um, are that they say what the biggest challenges they, they face with are that 46% of Afghans say literacy, or Afghan women say literacy and lack of educational opportunities um, are the biggest problem. 31% complain about lack of rights. 26% complain about unemployment. But it's not all doom and gloom. It's not all bad. It's not all war. There's life as well, by the way. Some of the positive things, again, from the same survey, is that 61% of Afghans are satisfied with democracy in their country. I mean, that's a staggering number, 61%. These are, this survey, you can go and check it out for yourself, it's online. 52% of Afghans say security has improved, despite what you're hearing, and what we are talking usually. And 48% of Afghans say they have seen improvements in rebu rebuilding uh, of the country. So those are good things. And finally, what can you do? You know, I mentioned my cousin, my aunt, my friend, my sister. In order for those women and the majority of Afghan women to live a life that is humane, dignified, and free, they need to have a responsible and responsible state and institutions that can not just protect them, but can provide for them, that has their interests at heart. They need a government that can respond to their needs. And that's where you can help, by supporting and lobbying for an inclusive, peaceful, and democratic Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sana, for this uh, uh, very sad uh, statement. And this is uh, a very tragic story. Uh, you took us uh, to Afghan uh, war history through your personal story. And as you said, rightly said, this is not uh, one story. This is the story of thousands of and millions of Afghan women and Afghan families. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this story with us. Uh, and um, it was very, very touching and, and emotional. And I really appreciate that you shared it. Uh, looking at, at what you ended your, your statement on, on the peace and peace environment, um, maybe I'll, I'll ask Dr. Neymat uh, to tell us uh, the, 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 the current atmosphere of peace negotiations and the political situation and the peace negotiations uh, between the Taliban and, and the US, U.S. government. And where, what does these negotiations between Taliban and, and, and the U.S. government mean for women in Afghanistan? Please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Saad Ali. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really a hard and challenging kind of situation for me to continue after what I hear from my good friend, Sana John, about her life story and the life stories of people closer to her. Before I answer you a question, I'd like to also remind everyone um, of the fact that the story you heard, like, rightly, like Sana John said, that this is the story of every Afghan. Um, there is also another side to that story. There is the tragic side, but there is also another side that deserves to be celebrated. And that's you, Sana John, women like yourself, who, women like you, your sister who lost her husband, women like your mother and so many other mothers who also are not losing the hope, 
by bringing up their girls and their daughters in the strongest possible way. And if there is one thing that makes me more proud than anything else to keep and stay hopeful about a better future in Afghanistan for people in general, but also specifically for women, it's this reality. I cannot simply ignore it because war, violence, especially the protracted forms of violence, the continued forms of violence, while it shatters you, it also, it also makes you very strong, that it's very difficult to, to be broken. And I think the story of Afghan woman has also that side that we need to admit and uh, uh, recognize. Probably it's not unique to Afghanistan, but here we are talking about this country that has been in war for as long as, in my case at least, my entire life. Um, I would like to thank uh, VIDC, uh, Dr. Seb Ali and Dr. Seb uh, Michael Fanaizadeh, uh, uh, for organizing uh, this excellent event and bringing together um, a variety of um, residents from Vienna and also the partner organizations. Um, sorry if I don't have the names of everyone, but uh, it's an honor for me to be here this evening. Um, and it's indeed an honor to share my perspective and views regarding uh, the latest developments in Afghanistan. Um, forgive my, uh, me, my Afghan fellows here, if my e immediate or sort of introductory remarks are a bit of a repetitive, uh, because I have no choice but to take you back a little bit to history of where the struggle from Afghan women has begun. What you heard from my friend is the most recent history. But one thing that we have been an advocate of, in the, particularly in the latest um, uh, weeks, as there are se more serious um, discussions around the future of Afghanistan with or without certain you know, forces such as Taliban, it is this um, wrong assumption that the struggle for women's rights in Afghanistan began in the post 9-11 context. And so now that the international community is trying to sort of withdraw from the country, and so what will happen to these, you know, struggles. So a brief historical reminder take us back to at least um, late 19th century, uh, where the king of the time, who for the first time was tasked by the powers around him at that time, in the 1818s, uh, uh, to, to take some specific actions in terms of state building and institution buildings. At the same time, this king, um, Amir Abdurrahman Khan, has also took some very first steps in terms of reforming uh, practices um, in the interest of women by, for example, um, abolition of some traditional customs, such as forcing widows to marry their deceased husband's brother, we know that this is an unfortunate practice still, but at least there was this king who have banned it at that time. And uh, raising the age of marriage, allowing women to inherit uh, property. So these are some actions taken by a king back in the 1800s. I don't know how many kings at that time were taking such actions. Um, there is no doubt that the same king was extremely abusive and uh, sort of, of focusing on the mon monopoly over violence and extremely abusive towards minorities. We admit that is also a part of the reality. But the fact that some reforms has been introduced by him and followed by several other leaders in Afghanistan came after uh, this, this person is something that needs to be recognized in uh, the interest of uh, learning historical incidents and historical events uh, related to Afghanistan. So women in Afghanistan uh, were um, considered as citizens in the constitution of Afghanistan in 1923, but more formal uh, um, uh, form of uh, rights, for example, for, uh, for, for voting in Afghanistan is recognized in the, uh, in the constitution of 1964. So I was looking up at Austria's um, um, uh, uh, women's suffrage, and that's like 1919, similar to Netherlands. And the more formal 
um, declaration uh, in the US, for example, was um, um, something called the, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, it happened in 1964. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about a country now that the recent history somehow uh, covered or sort of um, sh shaded the reality of an identity of a country that had the struggle for women's rights for a very long time although it is sometimes claimed that it's a very recent thing. So whether do those struggles and those um, um, uh, efforts for in defense of women's rights and promoting women's position resulted to positive actions by the government, by the leadership, and by women themselves is also questionable. So we know that back in those days, uh, the country was still in deep poverty, droughts hit the country, uh, natural disasters hit the country, and the relative peace in the country was, while it was taking shape in terms of the, uh, the government systems, whether we wanted monarchy, we were not very happy with the monarchy, so we started to have um, constitution, um, uh, constitutional monarchy, and then uh, followed by different leaderships and political systems in the country. So throughout these systems, there wasn't enough, there isn't enough evidence to show that there were strong anti-women uh, you know, positionings by different political leaderships in the country. Uh, what got really worse was uh, the most recent war that we have been in, and that's since uh, began, uh, which began since 1978. And in this war, uh, women in general have been the prime target of the war. So if the war kills millions of people, those who were left behind are women-hated fam families. There is a wrong term used for them, uh, uh, families without familiae uh, besar paras, or families without guardians. But in reality, you are talking about a country that there has been millions of widows who took care of their families, who brought up strong and dedicated Afghans to the society, who are now taking, in some instances, mm, strong positions in businesses, in politics, and in different other uh, positions. So the war systematically discriminated against women as we moved on. If we look into the war against Soviets, there were women who were active in the political systems. Within the pro-Soviet pro um, regime, there were women who were in the position, positions of leadership, although they had symbolic role, but there were presence of it. But also the anti-Soviet uh, resistance movement also had women, so I at least remember stories about women political prisoners during the pro-Soviet uh, regime uh, time. So we had thousands of people as political prisoners, but among them there were also women who were political prisoners. That can show uh, uh, or represent a clear evidence that women were also politically active at that time. So when we moved on in the Civil War period, when the different uh, uh, factions of the pro-Soviet, uh, anti-Soviet uh, fighters started to fight for grabbing more power and more authority, we have realized that the systematic gender-based discrimination has taken a stronger shape. So systematically, universities, public spaces for women started to shrink. There was no security and safety for women. And as a result, the situation uh, got into a stage where families themselves decided not to let their daughters go to school. Sana John's story of fear of not having a access to education is, is one among many, many similar stories from across the country. Now, Taliban took over in 1996, and since they have taken over, coming and introducing themselves as a force to bring peace and stability and to bring security, they have deceived people uh, by coming into force, by promising that, you know what, we are here as a force for peace, and stability and security, so allow us to have some restrictive you know, stances uh, for a period of time until we maintain control all over Afghanistan, and then we will come back to you and allow girls and boys, girls and women to, to have access to, to public life. But they were lying. It was proved by their ruling, because between 1996 and 2001, they have not only that they haven't opened any schools, but they have started to systematically close even humanitarian or organizations uh, uh, for having girls and women as their staff and as their workers. So the, the space for women systematically have been shrunk. 
to a stage that there was no formal presence of women at all. But I'm sure most of you in this room who, are, uh, who have knowledge or who have followed the news about Afghanistan in the Taliban time, you have seen the images of women with the burqas and women being shot in the stadium and so on and so forth. That's like, again, one side of the reality of Afghanistan's um, um, history. The other side of it is also often ignored by different, for different re reasons, is that women in Afghanistan across the country did not surrender to oppression. I'm confident you will have the similar stories from your grandparents during the world wars and how people were selecting and, and choosing their, or their own forms of resistance against oppression. It was the same story with Afghan women. They didn't simply accept all the rules. So, like um, it was said in my introduction earlier, I, have, I was in my early 20s in those days. I had to exaggerate a little bit my age to be taken serious by, by people in those days. Uh, but I was determined to uh, help out in strengthening a network of uh, home-based literacy classes ac across the country to places where my network connections and the connections, network connections of my colleagues who were together with me in that team allowed us to sort of uh, spread the word and encourage women to turn their guest rooms in the house into uh, classrooms and try to teach girls how to read and write. Most of the graduates from our those home-based literacy classes were top in their schools after 2001. So I'm proud to say that I was not the only one. I was not the solo star doing this. There were like hundreds of women across the country who took these initiatives. I'm happy to hear in Kandahar there was a husband and wife taking that initiative. I'm sure there has been similar uh, stories of women who have taken such initiatives across the, across the country. And that was our form of resistance against oppression, against something that could not match with our identity, whether national identity or religious identity. So I think it was enough to talk about the history. I just take a few more minutes that probably I have to, to focus on now what is happening. In terms of the post-2001 uh, context, um, I think a lot, I'm sure, has been said through the media, through the government, through the different uh, you know, channels, that the ach achievements of the post-2001 context cannot be simply denied. Uh, by not being able to deny the achievements of the post-2001 context in Afghanistan, we cannot also ignore the reality that we also are facing a lot of challenges. The system that we are ru ruled by has a lot of flaws. If you look at the corruption, if we look at lack of accountability, if we look at system of, you know, uh, in some cases, the power system of mafias operating in the country, these are the tremendous, you know, challenges, not uh, very different from other forms of challenges that Afghan people have been brought up with all in, throughout all these years of war. But as a matter of reality is that this system is protecting the Afghan identity. It provides a space for the Afghan woman to be actively engaged in decision making. It provides a platform for Afghan youth to express themselves, to express their views, their ideas, and to have uh, opportunities and possibilities to explore their talent. And I think uh, from whether we look at the women's participation across governance systems from the village level up until the top level of government leaderships, there are e excellent examples of Afghan women taking the lead without any fear, without any uh, uh, concern in, in making the best of their jobs. We also have a reality of uh, some women who are abusing their position and their identity as a woman. That's sort of sad and embarrassing reality of our context, but I'm sure we are not unique in that front as well. There are plenty of examples across the world, uh, from advanced and developed countries to developing countries, with women that are embarrassment to their um, you know, um, gender and to everyone else when it comes to focus on personal or prefer personal interest over public in interest. Uh, but, the, uh, but women in general are in much stronger position than any other time uh, historically that we, we could talk about. Uh, I have uh, my PhD research focused mostly on village level 
power relations, how decisions are made at the village level and how uh, different actors within the community are um, sort of um, influencing those decisions. And what I find in these kind of examples, um, and that's uh, at least I looked at two different um, you know, localities, Eastern Afghanistan and Central Highlands, and in both localities I come up with the same conclusion that women are more agents rather than victims of the processes and uh, of, of, uh, of their communities. They not only represent the demands and the requests and the desires of women, but they represent the desires and requests of their communities. They are considered as leaders of their communities to absorb and to sort of bring in resources to, the, to, to their community. Just to sum it up, I know you're going to write me that I have one minute, so I will just sum it up. Uh, three minutes. Sir? You have three minutes. Three minutes, wow, that's, that's a luxury, thank you. Uh, so to, uh, to, to, to sum it up, uh, we cannot simply um, um, ignore uh, the rights for women um, in this context uh, by saying, okay, this and that, uh, political military groups are considering everything that we have achieved in the last 18 years, and we have to just accept it. Uh, we are hearing some unfortunate reactions or sort of reflections from some of our strongest and most dedicated allies, I mean members of this dedicated allies, um, that the matter of women's rights and defending women's rights is an internal matter and women's rights and women's position in the peace process, for example, has to be taken care internally. No doubt, we internally are mobilized enough. I'm proud to sit here and say that Afghan women are now truly scaring the political decision makers, whether on the government side or on the opposition and the um, uh, Taliban side. They are all have, uh, are, are in a kind of a position that they have no choice but to make a comment. A Taliban uh, chief negotiator in, in Moscow had to make a comment about women's rights. And they have a little bit of a difficulties to make those comments because the way this brand Taliban is known globally is ac and accepted globally is to be anti-woman and anti uh, any form of you know, opportunities that they have to provide with women. But they, they provided some sentences and some words that, yeah, okay, within this and that framework, then we can we can allow, as if we are waiting for a small group of armed opposition who use terrorism as a weapon to set limits for us. So in, in the peace process, which is already pro problematic, and I'm happy to cover it in the, um, in the conversations in the Q&A uh, part, uh, the concern that women of Afghanistan have at the moment is not necessarily limited to the fact that we are not around the table. It's a little bit bigger than that. There is no Afghan talking to Taliban at the moment. There is no one from the Afghan state represented the people of Afghanistan. Not only that women are not there, but men, general Afghan people are not there. There are two sides, the armed opposition who continue, as we speak, they continue terrorism and uh, act of terror, suicide bombings, shootings and killing of targeting civil civilians as their means to achieve to their goals. And these people are right now talking to the Americans about peace in Afghanistan. So our desire and our expectation is that people who will be representing the Afghan population has to be individual, mostly from the younger generation, because it's not about the past, it's about the future. How will future look like? And they should be people whose families are living and experiencing the misery of war. Because no one, including people with, you know, having this blood relations with Afghanistan or whatever, no one can understand the pain of war as much as those who are experiencing it on a daily basis. So these are the clear demands that women in different, through different networks are sort of uh, spreading. Uh, last uh, Thursday, I was in the famous Loya Jirga tent. We have a grand assembly tent that can gather thousands of people at the same time. And we had 700 women in that uh, tent uh, coming from across Afghanistan and from all 30, 34 provinces of Afghanistan. And their messages were unique on their, on their own way. For example, a message from women in Uruzgan was, we would like peace, but not with any price. And then 
a message from, from Bamiyan was peace, uh, justice is a crucial part of peace, for example. And similar to this, from across the country, there were examples of uh, uh, women, messages about peace, about their participation, and about the recognition of their roles. So here, I think I, I would start by once again thanking uh, the organizers of this event and by saying that um, women in Afghanistan are not only demanding at this stage their own uh, presence and representation in such a, uh, such a uh, decisive uh, uh, situation and stage that we are, we are also demanding to, have, uh, been, uh, to be heard uh, on our views, on our uh, sort of recommendations uh, beyond women's priorities and women's needs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rosella Nemat, and thank you, Sana Safi, for again for coming to, to, to Vienna and joining this, this tonight's uh, uh, panel discussion. I, re I really appreciate it. Thank you for uh, and us. Uh, a big applause for the for our audience because we 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 made it 15 minutes. Actually, we surpassed the time. So a big applause for for, for our audience. <laughs>